One time I was driving on a freeway on ramp and there was a hitchhiker there and he was held, holding up a sign where he wanted to go and it said the moon. So I picked him up and uh, he sat in my van and I said, going to the moon, huh? And uh, you know, he kind of laughed and I laughed and I talked to him about Jesus. Well, he was a bit transient just passing through and I wanna tell you, I'm not on my way to the moon, but I am on my way to heaven and this world is not my home. Gonna be talking about it. You're gonna love it. Welkom bij Antwoorden met Belis Kanli. Het leven kan soms een uitdaging zijn, maar of het nu gaat om financiën, relaties, gezondheid of de vraag naar je doel in je leven, één ding is zeker: God ziet je. Hij houdt van je. En wat er ook aan de hand is, Hij heeft de antwoorden op je vragen. I want to read you some of the words of King David from Psalm 100. And 19, it will be up on the screens. He said this in verses 18 and 19. Open my eyes to see wonderful things in your word. I am but a pilgrim here on earth. How I need a map. And your commands are my chart and guide. I'm a pilgrim here on earth. That means a sojourner, a temporary resident, someone that's just passing through. God, I'm here for just a little time. And I need a guide since I'm just a pilgrim. I, I need a map. I, I need instruction. And he said it very clearly. I'm going to go to your word. That's my map. That's my chart. That's my guide. So we're going to be looking in the guide of God's word when it comes to this, this pilgrim, this sojourner's lifestyle. And there's a lot of things we could talk about, but, but due to the constraint of time, we're just going to center in on a few. And the first one, is this, since we are just sojourners and pilgrims, we need to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. That's actually a direct quote from scripture. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. First Peter 2 and verse 11 begins this way. Beloved, I beg you. Everyone say, I beg. All right, that lets us know. This is no small thing he's about to, to, to address here. He's not saying, look, I, I suggest and maybe you ought to think about this. He says, look, I'm pleading with you. I beg you. All right, what, what is he begging about? Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles or among the unsaved, that when they speak against you as evildoers, They may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Dear friend, if the enemy, through enticing our fleshly nature, can capture our thinking or our will, our conduct will be affected, which diminishes, if not altogether destroys, our witness for Christ. You see those two verses there in 1 Peter chapter 2, they're... They're connected. I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, you're just here for a little while. Abstain from fleshly lust. They, they wage a campaign, a war to capture your soul. He said, and then he said, let your conduct be honorable. What goes on in your soul affects your conduct. And if the enemy succeeds in capturing our soul, it'll affect our conduct. And then when those in the world speak of us as evildoers, well, they might be right because our conduct's not going to be honorable and they're not going to glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, it affects our witness for Christ. If our conduct is wrong, if our thinking is wrong, if our soul has been captured, then our conduct's going to be wrong and that ultimately affects our witness and that affects the thing that God prizes most, precious souls coming into his family. You know, fleshly lusts, can encompass anything from forbidden passions to flaunted pride. And those are extremes, but the flesh loves them both. The flesh wants to indulge in them both. You know, I had a friend that I made when I first got saved. He'd been a Christian longer than me, and we were both learning to play guitar. And so we would sit in the backyard and, and we would play guitars for hours on end. And we would sing to Jesus and we talk about scriptures. We pray together. We actually witness together. We shared the gospel with people together. 
really, really good friend. And then I, I left on a trip, was gone for quite a while, came back, and he was nowhere to be found. He'd sort of fallen off the map. And, you know, you couldn't just call someone on, on a mobile phone because they wouldn't be invented for about 40 years. So I didn't know what happened to him. And then, you know, I've been back now a couple months and I'm in the market one day and I run into him in the market. And he's there with a very attractive woman. And uh, I chatted with him a little bit and he sort of cut the conversation short and went his way. I thought, well, that was a bit strange, but yeah, it was good to see him. Well, about a week later, I ran into his older brother who was also a believer. And he said, Bayless, you ran into my brother in the market, you know, recently. I said, yeah, I did. He said, you know, he went into a tailspin after he saw you in the market. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he realized when he talked to you that you were still on fire for God and you're serving the Lord. And he realized how far he had fallen. You know, he, he got back to, he sort of gave into some things and started, you know, drinking excessively, started using drugs again, and he started sleeping around. In fact, the, the woman you saw him with, he, he's the latest one that, she's the latest one that he's shacked up with. You know, he, he still believed in Jesus, but he's living like a prisoner of war. His soul had been captured and he was filled with self-loathing. Um, he, as far as his witness went, it was diminished if not destroyed. And he was so tangled up in sin that he didn't even know if he could get free. Now, opposite end of the spectrum, you know, the flesh, as well as indulging in forbidden passions, it, it loves to be pampered and applauded. I think we, we all know that the flesh is like a spoiled child. It cries out and cries out for what it wants. And it's hard to make it stop. And the flesh cries out and cries out and cries out. And it's never satisfied. It always wants to overindulge, whether it's overeating, oversleeping, overspending, excessive drinking, excessive time in front of the television, the computer, or your mobile device. You got to get up in six hours to go to work in the flesh. It's just one more episode, one more episode. But I got to get up in six hours. Come on, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Something we like is going to come up. Keep scrolling. Half hour later, keep scrolling. Come on, come on, just a little more. You know something you like is going to come. We got, I got to get up in four hours. Come on, keep scrolling. I think we're all familiar with how our flesh operates. And the thing is, is that if we do begin to yield to a fleshly lust, if we continue, it will capture our soul. And that's anything from forbidden passions to what are the, all the things we named. But you can look in Galatians chapter five. It gives a pretty extensive list of the works of the flesh. And you'd be surprised at some things that are on there. The flesh cries out for these things. And literally the devil is good at prodding our flesh because he knows that these fleshly lusts, they're waging a campaign, trying to capture our soul, trying to capture our will, trying to capture our thinking. And if you yield and get caught up, yeah, you'll probably still go to heaven. You'll just live like a prisoner of war your whole time here on earth. And your witness for Christ will not only be muted, it might be silenced altogether. You know, Jesus used the metaphor. He said, look, if your eye offends you, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It's better you, that you enter into life, into eternity with one eye than to go into hell fire with two. And then he said, look, if your hand causes you to stumble and sin, cut it off, cast it from you. Better for you to enter into to life maimed than, than having two hands and, and going to hell fire. And then he said, look, if your foot causes you to offend, cut it off, cast it from you. It's better for you to, to you know, go, go into heaven, go into eternity with one foot than to have two to go into hell. And he's obviously using a metaphor. And there's a progression there. The eye represents our viewing habits. It represents our thinking. And that's where it always begins. And listen, if you're toying with, with certain things that are wrong, fleshly lust, Jesus says, pluck it out, cast it from you. He's not talking literally, but it's a metaphor for deal with it ruthlessly. Don't play with it. Deal with it ruthlessly in that stage. That's the easiest place to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it in the eye stage, it graduates to the hand. 
Now I'm not just thinking about it. Now I've reached out and I've partaken. And it may just be occasional, but now it's affected my conduct. You see, my, my soul has been captured and now my conduct may no longer be honorable. And Jesus said, hey, cut it out, cut it off. If that's the case, deal with it ruthlessly. Don't mess with it if it's in that stage, because if you don't, it graduates to the foot. And that represents it's now become a walk. It's become a habit of life. It's become a pattern, a way of liber living. And yeah, you can be set free. He said, deal with it ruthlessly there. You can be set free, but it's much harder than it will for sure take the power of the Holy Spirit to set you free at that stage. Believe for the delivering power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life. But see, when it comes to sin and the, and the lust of the flesh, you think of it, if you, if you put a thread around yourself, easy to break it. You can say, hey, look, I can take that or leave that. True. Wrap it around once or twice, you can break it pretty easy. I can take that or leave that, but you keep doing it. Maybe not so easy. Once, I can break free. I, don't, I can take it or leave it. A few times, I can take it or leave it, but you continue with it and you can't leave it because it has you. And the thing is, is when it gets to that stage, your soul has to really want it if you're going to be free. But you need to realize your soul can grow accustomed to being in bondage. Your soul can be accustomed to living in chains. And it doesn't always want to be free from what it has become accustomed to. That's why he said, I beg you, sojourner, pilgrim, you're only here for a little while. We only have a little while to reach a dying world with a living Christ. You don't want your witness to be muted or silenced. So abstain, deal with it, don't let it continue. And the next point that I want to share with you, sort of a two-sided coin, each side dealing with a different perspective or attitude. Here, here's the first thing. As pilgrims and sojourners, it's important for us to realize that very soon, grief will be swallowed up by glory. Very soon, grief will be swallowed up by glory. In speaking about the brevity of our time here on earth, the Apostle Paul said this to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction, just a moment, but it's working for us this exceeding, amazing, eternal weight of glory. I think about the Apostle Paul. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was slandered. He was shipwrecked. He was jailed. He was rejected. He was falsely accused. He was persecuted, chased from town to town, and he referred to all of that as a light affliction when comparing it with the glory to come. My friend, it won't be long. We'll be sitting down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We will see Jesus Christ face to face. Every tear will be wiped away, replaced with an indescribable joy. This eternal weight of glory. And the Amplified Bible translates that eternal weight of glory this way. That it's a glory beyond all measure excessively surpassing all comparisons, all calculations, a vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. There'll be a new heavens and a new earth and we will be the residents. Our sojourning will be over. We will enter into our reward. You know, I remember when Janet was pregnant with our first child, Harrison, and we'd gone through all the classes. I'm going to be her coach, you know, in the, the birth process. And her water breaks, so we, we rush to the hospital. And, you know, I mean, we've been praying. We think this is going to be great and easy. And, you know, one hour of labor turned into two, turned into four, turned into eight. Hard, hard labor. Turned into 12. 18 hours hard labor. She hasn't slept. She's in pain. And she, she, I mean, she's struggling and I'm trying to coach her, baby, breathe. Come on, come on, we're going to do this. The baby's going to be there soon. And all of a sudden, you're on the fetal monitor. The doctor says, look, something's wrong. Every time she has a contraction, this baby's going into distress. Something's terribly wrong. We need to do an emergency C-section. We said, doc, you sure? He said, yeah, we, we need to. So 
had an emergency C-section. Turns out the umbilical cord was wrapped several times around his neck, and every time she had a contraction, he was being strangled. That's why he was going into distress. So here's Janet, you know, 18 hours exhausted, struggling in pain. But I will never forget the wonder and the awe that was on her face when she held Harrison for the first time. She forgot all about this struggling. Listen, I did my best to coach her. I'm trying to coach you. Soon, very soon, we're gonna be stepping into glory. Your struggle will not last forever. In fact, no matter how grievous things are for you right now, when you step into the world to come, whatever you're going through now, you're going to deem it but a light affliction. And I know some will think, are you trying to minimize my pain and suffering? No, I'm not. I'm just magnifying the glory that's to come. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I think about that often. It's never entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I would stack my imagination up against any 10 of you. I have got the craziest, wildest, biggest, most colorful, bizarre, wonderful imagination that I think a human being can have. And I'll think about what's to come. I mean, just crazy outlandish. And God says, no, not even close. Not even in the ballpark, Bayless. Well, I think, well, I'm bigger, more. It's like, you have no idea. No idea. And you may be going through a rough patch right now. You may feel like it's hell on earth for you, but my friend, that pain, that grief will be swallowed up by glory and soon. Now, here's the other side of that coin. One, very soon grief will be swallowed by glory, but number two, Seeing that we're sojourners, I think it's important that we live life to the fullest. We should live life to the fullest. Yes, a new world is coming, but I'm, I'm not going to retreat into some sort of emotional hibernation while I wait for that which is to come. I think we ought to squeeze every drop of life we can out of each and every day. And we can do that while we serve God and while we serve the purposes of his kingdom. He doesn't want any of his children, never intended us to be grumpy, discontented, unhappy people who live shrunken, withdrawn lives. That's not God's plan for any of his children. Listen to the words of Solomon, Ecclesiastes 3 and 12. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. 1 Timothy 6 and 17 says that God gives us richly all things to enjoy. And the point is that even though we are pilgrims and sojourners, we don't have to be sullen and depressed. You can enjoy the ride if you have a mind to. Now, our time here was never meant to be torturous. Yes, we do have trials, but he's with us in those trials. Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. I wonder, those around us in our workplace, our family members, the people we interact with, does our countenance and our attitude, how does it make them feel about the kingdom? Man, if church makes you that sour, they look like they sleep in a jar of pickle juice every day. I don't want anything to do with it. Or do they see something about you and say, man, I don't get it. I know they got struggles like I do, but there's just, there's a light on their face that they're just something different about them. There's something good about them. They've got something that I don't have and I want it. My friend, I for one, as a sojourner and a pilgrim, as a follower of Jesus, I plan to love my family, to be faithful to my friends, to do all I can to lift and influence people for the kingdom. I plan to work hard. I want to laugh hard. I want to love well. I want to play hard. I want to live clean. I want to be courageous. I plan to live faithful. I'm a sojourner. I want to forgive much. I want to be kind. I want to be transparent. I want to take risks. I want to believe big. I'm a sojourner. I want to live large. I want to cry freely. I want to sing loud, listen more, keep my word, and keep my cool because I'm a sojourner. 
and I will live generously, putting the kingdom of God first because I'm not the owner. I'm only a steward of the things that I possess in this world just here for a little while, which brings us to our third and final point. Seeing that we're sojourners and we're just passing through, we need to live generously. You know, David got plans from the Holy Spirit to build a house for God. But God said to David, you're not the one that's going to build it. Your son Solomon's going to build it. You just, you just collect stuff and get ready. And so we read in 1 Chronicles Chapter 29, well, actually, before I read that, you know, let me, let me read something that David said prior to that. This is in Psalm 39, 30, 39, verse 4. Listen to his perspective. He says, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days on earth are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. We heap up wealth, not knowing who will spend it. Interesting. You know, some time ago, I remember reading one of the world's wealthiest men died. And there was just a buzz about, you know, how much exactly did he leave behind? I can tell you, he left exactly everything behind. He took nothing with him. He left it all behind. It's like, and so David, who, who said those words, in fact, you know, Timothy said this, or Paul said to Timothy, we brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. So here's David. He's, he's got all these provisions for the, that the house of God that's going to be made. And it says this, 1 Chronicles 29 and 3. David says, Moreover, because I delight in the house of my God, the personal treasure that I have of gold and silver, I give to the house of my God, in addition to all that I've already provided for, my, for the holy house. Now, he had given national treasures. The, the, the government of Israel had, had given for the house of God. And so David said, I'm giving my own stuff on top of that. And the leaders were so inspired, as you read on, the leaders gave extravagantly. And then all the people caught on, and they gave extravagantly and gave joyously. And David watches them give willingly and joyously. And this is what he says. He begins to pray. And here's his prayer, verse 14. He said, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this? For all things come from you. And from your own hand have we given to you. For we are sojourners before you and tenants. As all our fathers were, our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no hope of remaining. O Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name, it is from your hand and is all your own. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and delight in uprightness and integrity. In the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. So now with joy, I have seen your people who are present here make their offerings willingly and freely to you. Now listen to this. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the minds of your people and direct their hearts towards you. Keep forever in the thoughts and minds of your people, these things, and direct their hearts to you. What things? David's praying for us, for God's people in every generation, forever keep this in their hearts and minds. Number one, we're sojourners. God, keep it in their hearts and minds that they're just passing through. This world is not their home. And that ultimately, we're just stewards of things that belong to God and because of that, we should live with open hearts and open hands toward God's house and towards his kingdom. One man was asked, how is it that you can give so often and give so much from your limited income? His response was, well, when I shovel out, out of what I have in obedience to God, he shovels blessings back to me. And his shovel's a lot bigger than mine is. 
The truth is God's shovel is much bigger than ours. The scripture says to give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will men give into your bosom. God will move people to, to shovel back to us what we shovel out in obedience to him. I give out mercy, I give out kindness, I give out love, I give out forgiveness. I give out of my material resources in order to bring a living Jesus to a dying world. God will shove, shovel love and mercy and blessing and kindness and material supply back to me. The truth is we cannot outgive God and heaven is too real, hell is too hot, eternity is too long and time is too short for us to not be generous and, and involved in you know, bringing the gospel to a dying world. And my friend, it's not a coincidence you're watching me right now. God sees you, he knows you, he loves you, and he wants you to be his. Wil je meer weten en op de hoogte blijven van Antwoorden met Belis Kanli? Meld je dan aan voor de gratis maandbrief van Belis per e-mail of per post. God zegen.